Welcome to this masterclass with Neil Donald Walsh, the author of the Conversations with God book series that has been read by some 25 million people. And for those of you who've been following me for the last decade, the last 10 years, know that it's often listed as my number one or number two favorite book in the world. It's because these works completely change my life. Now, this masterclass that you're about to see is unlike any other masterclass I filmed. And when you watch it, you'll see why. I've never broken down in tears in the middle of a masterclass before. Neil is that influential a teacher. And I'm gonna ask you to have an open mind because some of the ideas he's gonna share with us are so different from how the conventional world teaches us to think. But that's the point of this class. It's about going beyond convention to become a highly evolved being. If you could certainly be blessed with this remarkable dose of wisdom so that you can step forward into the world and truly make a dent in the universe, but also be living your true identity, your true self, which according to Neil is understanding that you are a part of God. What would that look like? Well, that is what a highly evolved being is. And this class is designed to get you to start thinking that way. It is a first step towards taking a deeper journey towards evolving yourself into the best potential soul playing the human role that you could be. So a couple of things about this masterclass. Neil Donald Walsh created a program with Mind Valley called Awaken the Species. It's a quest on our quest platform. And when we released Awaken the Species, it immediately became the highest rated program in Mind Valley history. The first time it was released was November 2017. So I want you to know that this guy is a formidable teacher. Now here are a couple of things we're going to cover. You're gonna learn about the concept of highly evolved beings. You're gonna to learn to ask yourself life's magic question. This question opens you up to a deeper understanding of who you are and how to take decisions in your life. And you're gonna learn a beautiful technique that transformed my life when I first learned this many years ago. It's called the there I go again technique. So let's get started with this masterclass with Neil Donald Walsh. Hi everyone, welcome to a Mind Valley Masterclass with Neil Donald Walsh. So I can't express to you guys how long I've waited to be able to sit here next to this amazing, handsome, godlike looking man. Um, because Neil has had one of the most profound influences. <laughs> That's what happens when you talk to God too much. So in all seriousness, um, Neil, before we begin, I would um, um, love to just share with the audience why. For the last couple of years, you've heard me say that Neil's book, Conversations with God, has been one of the books which has had the biggest influence in my life. That cool? I don't, wouldn't want you to lie about it, so go ahead and say that. Awesome, I just wanted them people there to hear your voice. What I love about this guy is that he doesn't take anything seriously. Um, but definitely take this interview seriously because this is going to be some profound stuff. Okay, now, what happened was in 1998, I was on a camping trip. In, um, I was a student at the University of Michigan. I was on a camping trip and in Colorado. And this girl across the campfire, fellow student, handed me this book and she said, Vishen, you got to read this book, Conversations with God, Part 1. I would never have read a book with the word God in the title. I thought all such books were preachy, they make you feel guilty about life, um, and they set you on for these, these, these ridiculous ideas that I felt didn't belong in the modern age. So I read the first chapter, hardly paying attention, but little glimmers of, of, of wisdom would, would, would come to me. So I read the second chapter and the third chapter, and the next thing I know, I've read Conversations with God, book one, then book two, then book three, and the next thing I know, I have this guy um, um, on Amazon. I'm following his Amazon page. I'm waiting for every new book to come out of this man. And I'm reading every single Neil Donald Walsh book. And the reason for that is because these books, while they were coming from you, Neil, they felt like they were coming from within me. When you read these Conversations with God books, it feels as if you are stumbling upon your own truth. So I simply wanted to thank you and to recognize you for the, the, the vast impact you've had in my life. Okay, now that said, let me get on to the formal bio. You've heard this before, so you can daydream and not pay attention. Neil basically has, has written 
books which have touched 20 to 25 million lives. His books have sold 15 million copies. But you know why I say 20 to 25? It's because Conversation with God books get passed on from friend to friend, from father to son, from mother to daughter. They get passed on. And so even though 15 million books have been sold, perhaps 20 to 25 million people have read these books. Neil has thus so far written 33 books translated into, get this, 37 languages. I've attended Neil Donald Walsh seminars in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, in Ashland, Oregon, here in Barcelona, Spain. Neil has a massive fan following wherever he goes. And so um, really excited to have you with us, Neil, on Mind Valley. Thank you, Vishen. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I feel a little humbled. It's tough when I hear you're very sweet to make an introduction like that, but I, I don't want to feel falsely modest, I promise you, but I, I don't think I had anything to do with this. I just feel like an innocent bystander to whom a lot of things have happened. And I'm just watching the passing parade, watching it all go by, and trying very, very hard to live up to what's been said, what's been given to all of us in, in this material, and, and to not dishonor it. My, my biggest challenge is when I wake up every day, don't dishonor the material. So I try very hard to step into the living of what I've been offered. But I'm real clear that I didn't say a word here. I mean, I, all I did was ask the same questions that anybody else would ask, which is, by the way, the why so, why so many people feel that it's coming from them, because I just asked the same questions that everybody else in the world would ask. Simple, ordinary, everyday questions. And when people read my questions, they've written me letters telling me, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask. That's what I was going to ask next. That's you, you, exactly what I was wondering about. So all I did, Vision, was, you know, there's a wonderful playwright named James Thurber who created a, a character for the Broadway stage called Everyman. And it's widely known in the theater world as James Thurber's Everyman. I turned out to be James Thurber's Everyman. I just turned out to be every person, every man and woman and child who's ever had a question that they'd like to ask God and a question about life. And I received some interesting and wonderful answers, but they're not my answers. It's not my mind bringing it through, so I feel very humble and I feel very nervous every day of my life about living up to what's come through. So I'm doing my best. And that's kind of why I don't take anything seriously and I make fun and I try to lighten up because if I took myself seriously, guys, we'd be in trouble. And I love the fact that you say that because as soon as you write a book called Conversations with God, I mean, that's you, what I'm talking about. You're, you're playing in that same dimension that so many of the world's organized religions play in. And so many of these organized religions or the people who teach them take things way too seriously. Well, I, I think the mistake they make is that they consider themselves to be right. That is, there's no margin for error. There's no sense of, well, you know, this is interesting stuff and maybe it's valuable in your life, but it may not all be exactly correct. The, the challenge that leaders of the world's religions have, Vision, is that they have to take themselves seriously in the sense of imagining that what they're sharing and what they're saying is absolutely right. There can be no doubt. Because if they put doubt into the minds of the followers of those religions, the whole construction falls apart. But I'm just the opposite. I say to people everywhere I go, in every interview, in every lecture, in every workshop, in every retreat, in every, in every personal coaching session, I have a thing that I tell everybody. I could be right, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong about all of this. So you need to go within, you need to look inside, you need to go deeply in your interior and see if your soul resonates and harmonizes with, with what's been brought through. And if it does, fair enough. Then live it, demonstrate it, and walk in your life through it. But if it doesn't, if anything that you see there or that you hear me say does not resonate with you, throw it out. 
for God's sake, and I mean for God's sake, don't take me seriously. And that applies to this masterclass that you're going to be watching as well. I'd love for you to share the story of how Conversations with God came to be because it's a beautiful story. It's been turned into a film, a really beautiful movie. But what is astonishing about it is Neil wrote that first book while being homeless and really down on his luck. Well, what happened is that everything in my life was falling apart, Vision. My, my health was going rapidly downhill. One thing after the other, I had some heart issues. I've had heart cardiac issues all of my life, but I had other health issues as well. Peripheral polyneuropathy, other conditions. We all have our story, but that was part of my story. It wouldn't have been so bad if that's all, the, all there was. But at the same time, uh, my career had reached a dead end. I couldn't seem to get on track. I couldn't seem to get to, where I, get to go where I was trying to go. And so I had, you know, I was stuck in my career and going nowhere. And I could, I, was, I could see myself heading into a dead end. So I had health issues and career issues at the same time. Even that would have been, you know, manageable. But at the same time as all of that, I had relationship problems as well. But my relationship with my significant other, who is a dear, dear person and a wonderful woman, uh, I was meeting challenges in that area every day of my life. So, nothing in my life was working. I was being really hit with the triple whammy, I often call it. Relationship, career, health, all at the same time. And I just threw up my hands at one point. And, and as if this weren't bad enough, I had an automobile accident in which I broke my neck. And, and it wasn't a hairline fracture, it was a three-quarter inch avulsion fracture of the seventh cervical vertebrae posteriorly, in other words, the fracture was large enough to put a pencil through, not a hairline fracture. So of course I was immobilized and they gave me a collar that I had to wear for the next two years and I was told that I wasn't to do anything even, I wasn't even to allowed to lift a half gallon of milk, see too much pressure, I could hurt myself again, re-injure myself. So I was, I was immobile for a couple of years, going to physical therapy every day and then as if that, get a load of this, as if that wasn't bad enough, I was staying with a friend, I had no place to live, I had run out of money, I couldn't work anymore, I was totally out of cash, I was staying with a friend on their couch, couch, you know, couch surfing as it were. I go outside the next morning and my car is stolen. It's gone from the street. Now you know that life has really got it in for you when all this stuff happens at once. And I, I laugh at it now. I remember, the, I remember the moment when I went outside and the car was gone. I literally fell to my knees on the sidewalk, crying out to the sky. I know passers-by must have thought, you know, he's on something, what's the matter? But I was calling out to God, all right, all right, what do you want from me? What have I done to deserve a life of such continuing struggle? If somebody tell me the rules, I'll play, I swear, I'll play. Just give me the rule book. Tell me how it works. And after you give me the rule book, don't change them, because it felt to me that the rules were changing every day. First it was okay, then it was not okay, then it was not okay, then it was okay, and I was just like, whatever. And that's the space I was in, Vishen, when I sat down finally. In the middle of the night, I took out a yellow legal pad. One night, it was 4.23 in the morning, and I, and I wrote a very angry letter to God. What do you need here? Just give me the formula, for God's sake. It can't be this difficult. It wasn't meant to be this difficult. Or was it? So, I heard a voice over my right shoulder very calm, gentle voice. And I heard that voice in the room. It was actually physically in the room. Neil, do you really want answers to all of these questions? Or are you just venting, just getting it off your chest? And of course, I turned around, there was no one there, and I thought, oh great, on top of everything else, I'm losing my mind. I'm having hallucinations. There's nobody here. But you know, 
Strangely, just at that moment when I thought I had totally and completely lost it, I was overcome with a sense of peace, tranquility, serenity, and calmness, inner calm that I'd never experienced before in my whole life at that level ever. And I just, it felt as if all the anger, all the terror, all the fear, all the upset, all the frustration, it felt as if every ounce of negative energy that I had stored up had just been drained and just released from me. And I sat there and I began to weep. I wasn't crying, you know, with, racked with tears, just the soft, silent weeping of a person who has found pure joy. So I said to myself, okay, I really am getting it off my chest. I really am venting. But you know what, if you've got answers, I really would like to know what they are. And with that, it felt as if there was a download. It felt, the, the experience was as if something just went and suddenly I was downloaded with answers to the questions I had asked. So I, I had the yellow legal pad in front of me and I, I began writing what I was receiving, if I could put it that way. And I wrote down things and I, and I'm really clear that it wasn't stuff that I had remembered from a previous time in my life or had been taught when I was a child because what I was receiving in this strange and interesting way included material or information I had never heard of before, never even dreamt of. And I remember vividly remembering that or thinking that when I received the message, there's no such thing as the Ten Commandments. I literally dropped the pen. Wait a minute. Am I trafficking with the devil? Who would bring me that message? There's no such thing as the Ten Commandments. And when I asked God about all of that, she said, Neil, you've got me all wrong. You've got me all wrong. The whole world has got me all wrong. You guys just don't understand. So I said, well, then help us. But you know, the problem was this, not to make it God's fault, but here's the problem. Have you ever tried to explain trigonometry or advanced mathematics to a five-year-old? Just can't comprehend it. So the reason that what is accurate about God, about divinity and about life hasn't been more clear is not that we're not willing, we simply haven't really been ready or able, just exiting, just leaving the infancy, our species, just emerging from its infancy, just now really gathering sufficient understanding and sufficient maturity as a species to, be, to begin to consider, wow, maybe there's something here that we didn't understand. The understanding of which would change everything. And so suddenly now, Vision, humanity is open where we weren't open before, and ready where we weren't ready before, and able where we were not able before to receive information that seems to violate every prior notion we ever had about God and about right. life. Because, because these books, these books are challenging for some, because these books dispel dogma. I mean, I think if you'd written these books maybe 10 or 20 years earlier, the world probably would not have been ready. And there's no question. Not only, not only would the world not have been ready, but they would never, never would have even been published. Nobody would have published them. Very true. And, and they fundamentally change people's ideas of religion. Um, and again, if it, whatever religion you have, we completely respect that. A religion is, it can be a beautiful thing. Can, may, I, may I comment on that? Yes. Just quickly? Because I want to make it very clear that what I am saying and what the books have said has nothing to do with making religions wrong. You're absolutely correct on that. This is not about saying that religions are wrong. This is about making it clear that religions are simply incomplete. They just don't have all of the data. But what they do have, what they have, and have given us, is wonderful stuff, just as you've said. Marvelous principles to live by, incredible truth, enormous wisdom contained in all of the world's great religions, which is why they've lasted so long. But not quite all of the data. So we are like we, meaning humanity, 
Hum human beings are like little children who have learned to add and subtract, and they think that's all there is to mathematics. But there's more. There's multiplication. There's long division. There's algebra. There's geometry. There's trigonometry. There are advanced mathematics. There are ways to solve the problems that are much faster, much more efficient, much more complete ways to solve the problems than simply adding and subtracting with an abacus trying to solve advanced mathematical problems. So I was given that simile. God said, look, it's not that religions are wrong. They're simply the, at the first step of understanding. Are you willing to go to step number two? Are you willing to consider that there may be something that we don't fully understand here, the understanding of which could change everything? That becomes the central question facing humanity. So this is not about making religions wrong. It's just about candidly and lovingly and gratefully saying to those religions, thank you for what you've given us. Could you now give us permission to notice that there may even be more to know on this subject. But Neil, why is it, and here's why we're having this conversation, why is it that 19 years after book three came out, 19 full years, you decided to write book four? Well, I didn't decide to write book four. I was awakened in the middle of the night at 4.13 in the morning, surprisingly, and I had that feeling, uh-oh, I've had this feeling before. I haven't had this feeling for almost 20 years, but I remember this feeling from 20 years ago. This is a feeling that something wants to come through. I've had conversations with God all the way through those 19 years on a private level, but not that sense of an entire book length message wants to be shared. But that morning uh, in early August of uh, 2016, I, I awoke and I realized that's the same feeling I had back 20 years ago when the last book length message felt like it had downloaded. And you just feel full. I can't explain it. You just feel so full that you want to just get it out. You know, like when you see a long lost friend you haven't seen in eight or 10 years and you just want to get it all out and share everything that's happened in the past 10 years, that kind of a feeling. So I threw back the covers because I knew that I needed to get right to a keyboard. And I raced to my keyboard. And I began, I began just typing whatever was coming to my mind. And what came through was book four. And I recall saying at the beginning of the dialogue, I thought we were all done with this. I thought we, we weren't going to be doing any more book length exchanges. God said, well, you know, there's one more invitation that I have to place before you and before all of humanity. The first books placed before us two invitations. Number one, change the world's mind about God change the world's mind about God. Don't have the world eliminate God or get rid of religion. Just expand your notion of God and of what religion has to share. Number two, the second invitation, give people back to themselves. Don't you dare walk by or walk through the life of a single person without making them feel better about themselves, better about who they are, and fully aware of their magnificence and of the wonder of who they are, of the gift they bring just by being in the room. So I was given those two invitations. Change the world mind about God, give people back to themselves. And those invitations were given to all the world as well, to all the readers of those books. But now it was a third invitation. God's telling me in, this, in, this, in book four, I have a final invitation. I said, what, what could it be? Change the world's mind about God, give people back to themselves, what's left? And God said, awaken the species. Awaken the species. Get out there, you and everyone else who's reading this material, everyone else who's being exposed to these messages in any way, either in book form or electronically or in any way, use what you've now come to understand. If you have truly expanded and truly explored new possibilities that you hadn't even thought of 20 years ago. If you're reading now there and reading now ready, then for goodness sake, awaken the species. Tell everyone what it is that you now have come to know and understand because the world is now desperately in need of awakening. Is there something going on in the world? So this, this download came to you in the summer of 2016. Um, is there some shift happening in the world right now 
that this information is relevant at this point? Yes, well, it is that shift from infancy to our early, early adolescence, to our early childhood. It's that shift, and, and like, you know, like a two-year-old who has a temper tantrum, or you know, who, you know, like two and three and four-year-olds who just aren't quite ready yet with all the data that's coming in, so they start to, you know, in their innocence, misbehave. We are, in our innocence, misbehaving. Look, humanity is not a mean species. We're not a cruel species. We're not an angry species. But sometimes, sometimes we act mean. We act a little cruel. We act a little angry because in our youthful embracing of all the data that's coming in, all the stuff we never dreamt of before, we're finding ourselves faced with information that we don't know how to deal with, we don't know how to handle, we don't have the moral underpinnings to handle things. Let me give you an example. What's the moral underpinning to handle cloning? Guys, we're cloning sheep, we're cloning cats, we're cloning animals. That is, we are reproducing mammals without doing it the normal way. We're doing it in a laboratory. Now, why is that significant? I'll tell you why it's significant. We're only years away from cloning people. Cloning human beings. And even right now, we have the capability of using genetic engineering to create human beings that have been produced in the normal way. We can actually work with that tissue in utero and alter everything from the color of one's eyes to the tendencies, to the habits, to the levels of intelligence, to the characteristics of that emerging human being. But we don't have, guess what? We don't have the moral underpinning. We don't have the spiritual construction that supports where technology is racing ahead in producing a brave new world, as Aldous Huxley called it. So we somehow have to find a way to integrate, and that's what's happening, to answer your question. We are confronting the moment of integration. We either find a way to integrate a new understanding of God, a new understanding of life, a new understanding of ourselves, a grander notion than we might ever have imagined about all of it, and integrate that with where our science and technology and medicine is taking us. Medicine is taking us, Vision, to a place where within a few more decades or less, we'll be living to 150 or 200 years old. Mark my words, mm -hmm. I've long passed that stage. I'll be out of here in a, a few hours, after the way, the way this interview is going. But, 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 but truly, truly, we're gonna, it's gonna be nothing to live past 100, nothing. Right. So as we, as we see what medicine, technology, and science is placing before us, we have to have the moral underpinning to support the decisions we're going to be invited to make. So, so that reminds me of something you wrote in your book, right? You said, if you look at the progression of humanity, if, if we look at ourselves um, on the, say, and you map it out to be the length of a football field, we are somewhere on the two yard line. Do I remember that correctly? Yes. Could, could, could you explain that? We are somewhere on the two yard line. You explained it perfectly. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, uh, that, that's, that's true. Uh, that, uh, so we've got a long way to go. Yeah, but that's the blessing. And you, yes, and, and, and you said, and it's not that we are bad or we are primitive. We're just children. In a, in a cosmology of sentient beings, we're just children. And that's the blessing when you think of it. See, people, when they heard that from me at first, they thought, oh my gosh, what a horrible situation we're in. We're only on the two-yard line. I said, no, you don't understand. That, that, look how much farther we have to, can you imagine where we'll be when we're just on the 10-yard line, right. much less the 50-yard line. This gives you an insight into what we were really meant to be, what we were intended to be. I want to say what human beings were designed to be. We're just, just barely beginning to realize our potential. Which opens us up to the idea of HEBs, or highly evolved beings, which is what book four is about. Quick summary of chapter one. The three invitations from Neil's conversation with God are change and expand your notion of God, give people back to themselves, and finally, awaken the species. How to become a highly evolved being. Can you explain that concept? What is a highly evolved being? There are highly evolved beings who have advanced in their understanding of who they are and what life is all about. 
so far that they have now taken, taken it on as their mission to, how would I put it, to nurture and to assist so highly evolved beings, which I have you know, crystallized with the, with the acronym HEBS, H-E-B, highly evolved beings. HEBS in the universe are, I'm told now, and have been for a long time, assisting us. That is, they're bringing us information, insights, awareness, ideas, thoughts. You know, they're placing it in front of humanity in a wide variety of ways and allowing us to step into tomorrow. One day I'm going to write a book called Stepping Into Tomorrow because that's what they're inviting us to do. And they're inviting us to speed up the process. See, because I want to make this point. Evolution does not have to be a one, two, three, four, five, six progression. It can be a 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 progression. That is, it can be exponential. So things fold over times 10 every time we move forward. So what highly evolved beings are doing is helping us by placing into human consciousness and into human awareness the thought structures and the conceptualizations that would be required in order for us to support what I've said to you a minute ago for us to support where our technologies have already taken us. The danger is here. The danger is our technologies are moving forward faster than our cosmology. When technology moves forward faster than cosmology, suddenly you're like children playing with matches. Dangerous territory. And that's where we are right now on this planet. Children playing with matches. Bragging how we have nuclear weapons that can be flown by rockets and destroy other countries. World leaders who are actually serious. You think this is out of a comic book, like some villain in a comic book, but actual world leaders who are seriously saying, we have rockets that can destroy your country, and they make movies, animated films of your country being destroyed to place into the consciousness of humanity. So now we have a population that's living between fear and upset and bravado, that dangerous place between fear and bravado. Well, you think you'll be able to take care of me? We'll take care of you before you take care of us. And that's where we are right now. Let's build a wall between us and all the other people of the world so we can protect ourselves. Such thoughts would never have occurred to us in the 1700s or the 1800s or even the 1900s, but now in the 21st century, we think that's the only thing left for us to do. Surround ourselves with walls, build enough weapons to take care of any possible attack, attack first if it's necessary, and even if we wind up blowing the planet to smithereens, at least we did it in self-defense. And you're saying that's not how highly evolved beings think. Oh my goodness, of course not. Now in book four, you lay out a number of, of, of behaviors or rules. What, what is it that you call them for highly evolved beings? Well, the, the, they're, they're the differences. The differences between how highly evolved beings would respond to life as, as opposed to how humans who are living uh, in an unawakened state. What do you call those behaviors? Yes. Behaviors of highly evolved beings. How many are there? Well, there are many, but the 16 are listed in the book. I was given in, in the dialogue, I was given in the book, 16 specific behaviors because I was asking. Well, of course, I said to God, well, give me an example. Give me an example. What's so different about the way they behave in their life as opposed to how we are behaving? And God said, well, I, I can give you a list. I said, please. So I got this list of 16. And she said at the end of the list, of course, there are many more, but these are the, probably the most prominent of those behaviors. The, the vast differences between how you guys behave down there on Earth, because we're a very young species, and how highly evolved beings behave. And the chief one, I say, okay, what's the most important one? This is gonna sound so obvious, I'm almost embarrassed to share it, because we're all gonna go, no kidding. But the most obvious difference is, highly evolved beings have eliminated violence completely and utterly from their civilization. There's no violence of any kind, not even verbal violence, no emotional violence, and certainly no physical violence. They would never even dream of being harming or damaging or injuring on purpose to another, simply to resolve a conflict. We are so primitive on this planet. We have 
yet to figure out a way to resolve our differences without violence. And if we can't resolve our differences, then we just kill the other person. We'll show you. If you can't agree with me and we can't resolve our differences, how about if we just kill you, just eliminate you from the planet? That way you don't have to worry about resolving differences. We'll just disappear you. And you know, those are the kinds of thoughts that highly evolved beings look at this and say, really? So, so let me ask you a question about that. Really? So that's how you're going to solve it? Really? So Neil, what you just said, I'm, I'm thinking some of you are thinking, well, of course, highly evolved beings wouldn't do violence. Yesterday, I almost got mugged. And I want to ask you a question because me and well, my I, friend- I tried as hard as I could. Did you recognize me? <laughs> so, 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 so let, um, I want to, I, because I, I almost, me and my friend almost tackled this guy to the ground, right? So I, I want to I ask you if what we were doing was right. But before we go there, one of the reasons we're so excited to bring Neil onto Mind Valley Academy is because we de we're developing with Neil a new quest. Mind Valley's quest platform is a learning platform that where thousands of students enroll together and we go through a quest to upgrade some aspect of our life. They are quests for nutrition, quests for losing weight, and in this particular quest, it's a quest to help you embody the characteristics and principles and ideas of a highly evolved being. One of the most beautiful things about having a roadmap like this is that when you can see the map, you know where to get to, and you automatically find yourself moving towards awakening faster than if you're pursuing this on your own. But more on that later. Now, you just got me thinking. I Thank God was trying... For the first time. I don't think much. So this guy tried to... We were having dinner as a family. My kids were there. And this guy tried to grab my iPhone from the table. Right now, firstly, it was stupid of me to be leaving my iPhone directly on the table. We were eating outdoors in Barcelona. I happened to push him away. And then he went off, but there was a part of me that wanted to tackle him to the ground and have my friends call the cops so he wouldn't do that to other people, right? Would that be counter to being a highly evolved being, tackling this man to the ground and calling the cops? I'm asking because I don't know. Um, in, see, everything is contextual. Things happen in context. In a society of highly evolved beings, it never would have happened to begin with. He wouldn't have right. reached for your phone. Um, if he, if you, if he reached for your phone and you pushed him away, uh, I would probably not go after him and tackle him to stop him from doing it to someone else. I would probably, I would have, I would have stopped him and I would have said, hold it, sir. You don't have to run away. Hold it. You don't have to run away. Would you like some money? You want some cash? Are you in such trouble in your life that you actually want to steal my phone? Hold it. Just a second. I've got 300 euros for you if you'll just stop where you are. And by the way, whether he stopped or not, there would have been a huge message for everybody in the restaurant. Even if he didn't stop, even if he kept on running, everybody in the restaurant would have gone, did that guy just offer the potential thief 300 euro to stop running, giving him a reward to not get away? And if he did stop, I'd say, come on over here, pal, come on. Hey, look, you know what? If things are so tough for you that you have to violate your inner sense of who you are, because I know that deep down inside, like all of us, you're a wonderful person. There are people who love you, people that you love, I'm sure. You're just, you're no less wonderful than I am, but you may have had a tougher life, a few tougher breaks that I didn't have. If you feel so desperate in your life that you have to reach over my shoulder and try to grab my property off the table, I'll give it to you. I really need my phone, because you know, all my dad is here. But if you want enough money to buy your own phone, and a couple of them, or two or three if you want, here. Look. What do you need? Take it from me. I mean literally, take it from me. You don't need to do this. There are other ways to experience the wonder and the glory of who you are. And if you'll promise to me and give me your deep soul promise that you won't take anyone else's property ever again, I'll double what I just gave you. How about 600 euros? Come on, we'll go to the ATM. We'll get it out of the machine. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm not going to report you to the police. I'm going to report you to yourself. I'm going to give you a chance to report in. Who am I really? 
this guy sees me. This guy sees me as who I really am. That's what I would have done. Wow. That, that obviously, I, I have a lot to learn. But I, I wanted to bring that up because I didn't want people there hearing what you just said about highly evolved beings not practicing violence and go, oh, I know that. What I wanted you guys to get a sense of is that to really know that you are operating in a way that is so counterintuitive to what our societies and our rules and maybe even how we've been brought up to operate. I gotta tell you that I was in uh, one of the third world countries. Frankly, I forgot where, where I was. I think it was near, near Machu Picchu. But in any event, I was in a third world country where I was going to give a talk, yes. But on the way there, there was a little festival, a street festival, where the little artisans, the locals, the local people had, had made little handkerchiefs and, and you know, little caps and gloves and things they had knitted and all these wonderful artifacts. And they, were, and they were selling them on the street off their table. And so I was traveling with some people who were with me, you know, some companions. And, and so they were saying, oh, look at that. That's beautiful. So how much? How much? And the lady would say, you know, I'm going to make it up, you know, 20 pesos. And, she, and the, the guy would say, I'll give you 15. And I said, why? And he was bidding her down when she said, oh, okay, 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 15 pesos. He said, 10. And he was bidding her down. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, what are you doing? I said, what was the original price? She said, 20 pesos. I said, I'll give you 40. She looked at me, she said, what? No, just 20, senor, just 20. I'll give you 40. Okay. Okay. 40 pesos. I said, you take 40? She said, yes. I give you 60. I'm bidding her up. And no matter what she accepted, I doubled it. I bid her up. And the guy next to me thought, this guy's crazy. See, because, and I thought, what am I doing on this street where I earn more money in a day than she will earn in a year? And I'm trying to get her to come down on her price, a scarf that she took two hours or more to make? Come on, wake up, stop it. Just stop it. That's, that's beautiful. I, I almost, Sorry, I'm at a loss for words. Neil, one of the things I really value about you is that the exercises, the ideas that you've put out and suggested us to do, wake us up to who we really are. When I was living in New York, I learned an exercise from you from one of your books. And it was, I remember judging the homeless people who lived on the streets, right? There was the alcoholic guy. There was the guy who would, you know, um, randomly yell abuse and foul language. And I, I, I would pass them on the way to the subway every day for months. And then I read about this one exercise that you suggested we do. And I, I'd love for you to share it with the audience here because it was so powerful. And it was called something along the lines of when you see someone, you would mentally tell yourself, there I go again. Could you talk about that exercise? Yeah. Chapter two summary. Highly evolved beings are here to assist us. Evolution is exponential. The current danger is that our technology is moving faster than our cosmology. There are 16 behaviors of highly evolved beings. Well, it was given to me by a wonderful spiritual teacher about 20 years ago. I, we were walking down the street in the city in which I live, and there was a, a man, a wino, you know, sitting on the ground, leaning up against the building, you know. He hadn't shaved in months, and he, you know, didn't smell all that good, didn't look all that good, and he had a little brown paper bag in which he obviously had a bottle of something, and he was tippling the bottle, and, you know, he was, like you said, shouting obscenities, people going by, oh, ah, you know, and you, everyone was like, oh, you know. But 
I looked at him and I said to my friend, there but for the grace of God go I. There but for the grace of God go I. And I thought I was being compassionate and open-minded. And my, my, my spiritual friend looked at me and she said, you don't understand anything at all, do you? I said, what, what? I was, I was trying to be compassionate. She said, not there but for the grace of God go you. There because of the grace of God you go. There you go being a wino again. There you go being a thief again. There you go being better than, you know, again. There you go again. She said, don't you realize you're seeing nothing but you everywhere you look? There you go being angry again. There you go being nice again. There you go using foul language again. There you go using elevated language again. There you go being a person you really don't want to be. There you go being the best person you've ever been. Whether you're seeing the negative or the positive side of life, you're not seeing anything except who you actually are mirrored back to you. So she challenged me, Vision. She said, I want you to go down the street for a half hour a day for the next 30 days. And whatever you see, whatever you're looking at, say that to yourself. There I go again. There I go again being that. There I go again being that. There I go again then being brave. There I go again being a coward. You know, and just until you identify with all of it. And then she gave me a second exercise called the I am exercise. She said, after you do that, I want you to expand your awareness. I want you to say two words or three words whenever you see anything, not just people, but a tree, a flower, some trash, something pretty or something ugly. I just want you to say these three words, I am that. I am that. Until you can identify with whatever you're looking at, I am that, I am that. I am that, I am that, I am that, I am. When I was a child, I was taught in catechism class that God said, I am that I am. I said, I said to the priest in catechism class, what does that mean? I am that I am, what, what, is, what, what the heck does that mean? And I never understood. And then after she gave me this exercise, I realized that because I was saying to this person, I was with, a few weeks later, I was with someone else, and I was walking down the street and I was saying quietly in my head, I am that, I am that. She said, what are you doing? I said, oh, it's just a, little, just a little exercise I was given. I'm just saying to myself, I am that, I am that, I am that. She said, Neil, you're losing it. You're losing it, man, you're not that, you're you. You're not that, you're you. I said, no, 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 I am that, I am. I am that, comma. I am. No, I am that. I am. God was convincing us. I am that. I am. And when I see in everything that I look at a part and an aspect of me, I finally got the truth. And it causes me to relate to the pile of trash, the beautiful flowers in the garden, the tree on the side of the road, the person leaning up against the building, drinking out of a bottle, and the beautiful angel as well, who walks down the street and makes you catch your breath at the wonder of who she is. It makes you relate to everybody in a totally different way. A way that just simply says, you know what? I love you. I love all of this. What a glorious experience. I love it all, and I refuse to condemn any of it. Judge not, and neither condemn. And raise not your fist to heaven, and curse the darkness not, but be a light unto the darkness, that you might know who you really are, that all those whose lives you touch might know who they really are as well because you came through their life. Vision, I was taught and I was told in my conversations with God, make sure you never walk through any human being's life, but that it's made better. 
because you did. It's really very simple. There's nothing complicated here. Neil, that, that's beautiful. A beautiful story. I did that exercise that I learned from you. I walked through the streets of New York. I, I, I would mentally tell myself every little thing I saw, the noisy guy on the subway, the guy begging um, on the street corner, and I would go, there I go again, being noisy and loud and rude on the subway. There I go again, begging while reeking of alcohol. And 30 minutes, in 30 minutes, I remember I had to go back to my apartment because there were tears streaming down my, my cheeks. But it fundamentally changed my relationship with the city, with the community, with everyone there. I started to give a damn. And you know, when you live in a place like New York, sometimes you get, you get closed in. I started to actually give a damn. That exercise changed my life. I never disrespected homeless people again. I, I, I never judged them again. And, and that was what was so powerful about the exercise. I share that because in the Mind Valley quest that we're developing with Neil, you don't just learn about these behaviors and these characters of highly evolved beings. You have to go out there and do these exercises. And I want to state, it is one of the toughest programs we've ever developed at Mind Valley. It is a challenge. It is a tough program because you are going to be going out into the world and you will have to think and, and relate in a fundamentally different way from what your society, your education, maybe even your religion said you need to do. It is not going to be easy. Dramatic shifts will happen, not just for yourself, but for every single life that you encounter on this planet. So let's do a quick recap. You've learned about the concept of Hebs, highly evolved beings. You've learned that even despite a lot of personal growth, someone like me, <laughs> I've read maybe hundreds of books, I make these wrong decisions. I almost tackle that mugger rather than truly, as Neil, you said, behave like a highly evolved being. There's no such thing as a wrong decision. You haven't made a wrong decision in your entire life. If you had jumped up and, and tackled the mugger, that would not have been a wrong decision. There's no such thing as right and wrong. There's only what works and what does not work, given what it is you're trying to do. But right and wrong don't exist in the kingdom of God. And I don't want any of you who are moving through your life to suddenly become worried that you're making a wrong decision or making a wrong choice. There's no wrong way to do anything. There's only what's effective. There's only what works and what does not work, given what it is you're trying to do. The reason that I suggested stopping that mugger and, uh, and, and offering him you know, whatever help he could use is because I'm clear what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to get him caught by the police and thrown into jail for 60 days and make his life even worse. I'm trying to make his life better. So when I know what I'm trying to do, my next action arises spontaneously, quite spontaneously inside of me. So my suggestion as a tool for you to move forward is to get clear. What are you trying to do broadly in your whole life? And then reduce it down to this year, this month, this week, this day, this hour, and right now, right this minute. Ask yourself the same question as you move through life. Wait a minute, what am I trying to do here? What am I trying to do here? What am I doing here? When you get clear on what you're doing in each moment of your life and why you're doing it, your actions will arise spontaneously without planning and without judgment and without making yourself right or wrong. That's my observation, you know. Thank you, thank you for saying that. That, that was another key lesson. I could be wrong about all of this. I, I don't know, it's just what feels to me. There's a magic question. Chapter three, a summary. There is no right or wrong. There's only what is effective given what you're trying to achieve. It's therefore essential you get clear. What are you trying to do? You are always seeing a reflection of who you are. Practice the there I go again exercise to help you identify with everything in life. Practice the I am that I am exercise for the same purpose.
people often ask me, Neil, give me a tool, give me a tool. Do you have any tools you can give me so that I can really move into this place of selecting myself to be a model for others? Here's a tool. Life's magic question. Before you make a decision to do anything, before you decide anything big, like to move house, or, or where will I work, or who should I marry, or who should I make love with, or you know, a fairly major decision in your life, or a small decision, what shirt should I wear, what food should I eat, how shall I comb my hair, whether it's a big decision or a small decision, ask yourself life's magic question. What does this have to do with the agenda of my soul? Oh, I see. And what does this have to do with the agenda of my soul. As you're going into the movie theater, what does this have to do with the agenda of my soul? As you're sitting down in the restaurant ready to eat your meal, what does this have to do, the food that I'm eating, with the agenda of my soul and what I ordered off the menu? If you aren't clear what it has to do with the agenda of your soul, don't do it. And if you're not clear what the agenda of your soul is, get clear on that. Now, the agenda of, I'm sorry, I'm starting to preach. I should just shut up. <laughs> no, please continue. You can't leave us hanging there. Well, the agenda, the agenda of the soul is the same for everyone. It's not like your agenda is to play first base for the New York Yankees, and my agenda is to be the first chair violinist for the Philharmonic Orchestra. It's not like a career choice. God is not a career counselor. The agenda of the soul is the same for every living being on the planet, as I understand it. And that agenda is this, to use each golden moment of now to make an extraordinary decision, to announce and declare, express and fulfill, become and experience the next grandest version of the greatest vision you ever held about who you are. The agenda of the soul is to recreate yourself anew in every moment in the next grandest version of the greatest vision you ever held about who you are. If you were to serve that agenda with every word, every thought, every announcement, every decision, every action, your life would suddenly turn into an ongoing, continuing, and never-ending miracle. I like to use the example, we're all adults here, of people who are enjoying a romantic moment. You're having a romantic liaison with someone to whom you feel very close. Why are you there? To get something? or to receive something, to take something or to give something? What is it that you're really up to? Is it just about sexuality? Is it just about physical pleasure? I mean, it's okay if that's part of it, but is that the largest reason? Is that the whole purpose of it? Or is there something larger going on, something greater happening? And if you were to have a romantic interlude with your beloved person, and if you said to yourself, I'm choosing to recreate myself anew, in the next grandest version of the greatest vision I ever held about who I am, in this context, in this moment, in love expressed in this wonderful physical way, how would that impact the moment you're having with your beloved partner? Do you think it would change in any way the quality you're bringing to that moment? I promise you, I promise you it would. Trust me on this. I love that phrase, to recreate yourself anew into the next grandest version of the greatest vision you've ever had for yourself. Yeah, it, those words were given to me by God when I, when, I, when, I, when I raised my hands in despair 25 years ago. What is going on? What's the point of all this? Is it just the same experience over and over again? Trying to get out of one jam after another, trying to get out of one spot. What is going on? And God made it very clear to me, look, I'm sending you nothing but angels. It was one of the greatest pieces of information I ever got from God. He said to me, Neil, I have sent you nothing but angels. And they're going to come into your life, and they're going to place before you exactly the situation and circumstances. You may judge it, judge not, and neither condemn. They're going to place before you the exact and perfect set of circumstances and situations, allowing you to be who you really are at the next level up, and the next level up, and the next level up, to never be satisfied with yesterday's decision. I'm going to write a book one day, Never Be Satisfied with Yesterday's Decision. 
Let's talk about that for a moment. You were talking about the qualities of highly evolved beings, right? And um, one of the, the, the most profound ideas I've learned from you, from your children's book, actually, The Little Soul and the Sun, is that line, I've sent you nothing but angels. I'd love for you to explore that topic a little bit more. What do you mean by that? I mean that every person who's come into your life, and for that matter, every situation that has arisen by any manner or means, has been placed before us as a gift from heaven. The purpose being to allow us to enter a contextual field, to notice and to express, to experience, to declare, to become and to fulfill our grandest notion of who we really are. I mean by that, that in the absence of what you are not, what you are is not. If I'm the light, I can't experience myself as the light unless I'm in the darkness, because the darkness is what I'm not. But in the absence of what I'm not, that is in the absence of darkness, I can't be what I am. That's true not just of dark and light, but so-called good and so-called evil, loving and not so loving, you know, whatever it is. So I have sent you nothing but angels means that God has sent us, or life, if you please, has produced for us. Our souls are collaborating together all souls collaborating, co-jointly producing the exact set of circumstances, situations, and moments designed to provide us a platform on which we can produce the greatest play ever known. Shakespeare had it right. All the world's a stage and the people but the players, all the men and women simply having their various roles, they're making their entrances and their exits and each person in their time playing many parts. So is what you're saying then that the guy who at one point rear-ended you, causing you to have that massive fracture on your neck, then the guy who stole your car, causing you to get down on your knees and, and, and exclaim to God, what is the point of all this all? All of those were angels. So that... was the guy reaching for your cell phone. Right. Hello? Because an angel reaching for your cell phone, giving you a chance to decide who am I in relationship to this guy wanting to steal my phone? Who am I? And what is my next grandest notion with regard to that? And then we bless him. We, we don't curse him. We don't follow him as he's running away and curse at him. We actually bless him. Even if he gets away and doesn't turn back, we say, you know what? Bless you, my bless you as somebody much more eloquent than I will ever be once said very clearly, bless, bless, bless your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And when a man slaps you on the right cheek, turn and offer your left. And when a man asks you for your coat, give him your shirt as well. And when a man asks you to walk one mile with him, Go with him, Twain. This is not New Age philosophy. We've been given these answers thousands of times over thousands of years. Is it time for us to listen? Thank you, Neil. Normally at this point of a masterclass, I, I do a recap of all the points that an author or our guest has said. I can't even do a recap here because there is, um, I'm in a different state right now. I'm trying my best not to have tears stream down my cheek as I'm interviewing you. But I think you guys, each of you would have taken something different from this. Neil, thank you so much. Are there any closing words you'd like to say? Your life is not about you. I ask God, what is the most important single sentence that you want me to understand and to embrace? And she said, I'll give it to you in just a few words. Your life is not about you. It's about everyone else whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. If you take nothing from this particular hour we've just spent together, then that message, that's all you'll need 
to transform your experience of who you are and to touch everyone else in life in a way that will allow them to begin to experience who they are. So remember that always. Your life has nothing to do with you. It's about everyone else whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for joining us in that masterclass. Now, that class ended a little bit unusual compared to most masterclasses we do because after speaking to Neil, I was so emotional, I couldn't continue. I, I, I normally, at the end of a masterclass, talk about the quest with the author so that you guys can sign up to go deeper into a study with the author. But at the end of this one, I had had an emotional shift. I'd had an emotional breakthrough. There were tears streaming down my face, and we had to cut the filming. I needed some time to compose myself, and which is why I'm here today. And, and um, um, maybe you had a similar experience during that masterclass. So let's get grounded, and let me summarize what happened there. So the first thing you learned in that class is the concept of highly evolved beings, that there is a, another level we can reach when we truly awaken. And when you get to this level, so many things in your life shift, not just your happiness level, not just the amount of wisdom you're able to emanate to the world, but the way you function in the world shifts, your job shifts, your career shifts, your relationships shift. Negative emotions like depression, like stuff that typically bring us down, start dissolving away because you understand that your life has a greater purpose, it has a greater meaning, and there's a bigger reason why you're here. That's one of the biggest things that Neil's teachings does for people. And you'll see this when you go through the Awaken the Species quest. So the first concept was highly evolved being. The second concept you learn was life's magic question, a tool which supports and guides you whenever you have to take a decision in life. The third concept you learned is the there I go again exercise. Now some of you might wanna go deeper into these ideas. You might want to go on the path that Neil has outlined. It's a curriculum to awaken you to your highest self. This is what we've put together with Neil in the Awaken the Species quest on Mind Valley. In the quest, Neil talks about the 16 characteristics of highly evolved beings. Now, these were ideas that he channeled after writing book three of Conversation with God. So after book three of Conversation with God, there was a period of 19 years where Neil didn't have that experience again of waking up in the middle of the night and having this, this voice speak to him and, and being moved to write down the words of, in his mind, God, which he says could have been a subconscious, could have been a higher power. He doesn't want to make any bold claims, but it was 19 years before that experience came back. And it happened again in August of 2016. And that's when Neil woke up in the middle of the night hearing that he had a new mission in life. And that new mission was to awaken the species. Neil started writing. Over a period of one week, he completed the manifesto for this mission. He sent me a PDF, I read it, and it shook me. It, it, it was a beautiful model of where all of us as individual human beings can aspire to be, to live the greatest version of the grandest vision for yourself. And so I sat down with Neil and we asked ourselves a question. Reading this was one thing, but how could we create a program where people could actually experience that transformation? Because I wanted this for myself. I wanted this for my loved ones. And that's how the Awaken the Species quest came to be. So in the course of this month that you're gonna spend with the community and spend with Neil, you're gonna go through the 16 behaviors but as I said, it's not just learning at a conscious level. You have to apply this in your life. And so Neil is gonna give you homework. And that homework is to practice some of this behavior in your life and watch what shifts. That's the most remarkable thing. Many people here at Mind Valley who have taken this quest have said that it has completely changed them. They feel like a new person after they've completed it. So for those of you who are new to Quest, Quest is perhaps the most advanced learning platform in the world in terms of how satisfied students are and how many students start and then complete. And the reason is the technology it's built on, the behavioral principles, but mainly the community that comes together on this Quest. When you join this Quest with Neil Donald Walsh, here's what happens. We'll have several thousand people start together on the same day and every day, Neil comes on on your smartphone or your tablet or your Apple TV, whatever device you choose, and ingrains in you a behavior of a highly evolved species. Using a form of behavioral stacking, one by one, we cause you to awaken into this idea, into this truth. And 
as you're going through this, there's a supportive community that's interacting with you. They're going through this with you. And you find that in our Facebook group, a lot of people are coming together, supporting each other, sharing insights. It's really, really, really profound. Many people make amazing friendships in this group because over the course of this quest, which takes place in about a month, you fundamentally transform. People start sharing their breakthroughs. You start experiencing breakthroughs. You start seeing that you are not alone in the world and you uncover this whole new dimension of yourself. It is, to be fair, what many of our students have said, the hardest program Mind Valley has ever produced. And I just want to let you know that because you're not just learning these principles from Neil. He's going to push you to practice those principles every day, layering on one of these principles. When you show up at work, when you show up with your family, and it's not going to be easy, but you're going to have a breakthrough. And this program, and it was first released in November of 2017, immediately became the highest rated program in Mind Valley by far. It set a new benchmark for how satisfied and transformed our students were. So if you're interested in checking out this program, know that directly below this video, there's information on the quest with Neil Donald Walsh. It's called Awaken the Species, and you can enroll immediately. And as a reward for spending the last hour with us, you get an instant unlock bonus. Now, some of you might want to try this out first. Not a problem. You can enroll, and you can go all the way into day 10 of the program. And if you feel this isn't for you, you're free to send one email to support at mindvalley.com, get an instant unconditional refund. We want you to try this because we know this isn't going to be for everyone. But those of you who go through this, you're in for an amazing transformation. You saw the impact Neil had on me just on that masterclass. And I'm not an easy guy to crack, but he cracked me wide open. And that's what happens in this quest, Awaken the Species. I just want to share with you what some people are saying about their experience going on the Awaken the Species quest with Neil Donald Walsh here on our Mind Valley platform. So Rabia Veal from London said this, I will never be the same again. It has been the deepest cleansing and most profound shift in me. Jason Campbell, who is a, a well-known host and personality at Mind Valley, he did it too. And one of the things was, it was amazing seeing Jason's transformation after it. He said, I now see life in a new light and I have the quest to thank for challenging so many of my beliefs at a fundamental level. Now, Neil says that the people who come to his books, the people who come to his programs, they are often drawn there through this weird synchronicity. Often they say, this entered my life just when I needed it. And Albert Urena, said the same thing. He's from Coral Springs, Florida. He said, this quest was just exactly what I needed. It changed my life in multiple ways. It changed my mindset about God. It helped to change my mind about death. Ever since I took this quest, I've become a much better person. So if you feel a calling to try this out, stay tuned till the end of the masterclass where you'll learn more about how you can enroll in this quest. And um, the final thing I want to add is that many people say it was the single best online program they've ever taken. Nancy Naish from Canada said, this is one of the best courses I've ever taken for furthering my spiritual evolution. It is content rich and needs to be savored and worked on for much longer. So I invite you to join us in this adventure. All the information is below. Go ahead and enroll in Awaken the Species. Remember, you can try it out for 10 days to see if this is for your liking. Get a full refund if you feel this isn't for you. And no that you're about to embark on a remarkable journey with a truly remarkable group of people because think of the type of man or woman who's going to join this. These are not ordinary human beings. These are human beings on the cusp of waking up and they are ready to get themselves to a whole new level because they don't want to just shift their life. They want to make an impact on the world. And you're going to be studying with this group of future world changers. So I cannot wait to see you on this quest with Neil Donald Walsh. All the information is below. What have I learned from Neil Donald Walsh's teachings? Wow. It's so much that it's hard to mention one or two things. For me, it was wisdom in self-expression. A belief in something much bigger than myself. He asked the question, what would love do in this situation? Ever since I took the quiz, I just become a much better person. Much more grounding, much more faith. I see every human being now as an expression of God. I have become so much more generous with other people, but mostly with myself. If somebody asks me who Neil Donald Walsh is, I 
would generally say? He is、um, a teacher and a philosopher and someone who helps wake you up to what your soul already knows is true. The reason why I love Awakening Species Quest is basically because it literally changed my life. This has become a personal bible now. I see that everything in life happens for me. Nothing in life ever happened to me. It's the most transformational experience I ever had when it comes to online courses and the community there. I use it every day. From the bottom of my heart, I really want to encourage everyone to take this course. This course has brought so much clarity. My evolution as a spiritual being has been amazing, and I keep evolving every day. Thank you, Mayan Valley, and thank you, Neil Donald Walsh.